All righty, welcome to the Celtics Lab podcast brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. I'm Cameron Tepke, your host. I'm joined by Alex Goldberg down in Brooklyn. Dr. Justin Quinn has the day off, but to fill in, we have from Celtics blog, my friend and yours, Noah Dalzell. Noah, what's up? Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, Noah, we've, we wanted you to come on for some time, but this is the perfect episode because in the lab portion of programming, we're going to be looking at the bench for the Boston Celtics and how the players perform and what's good down there on the bench. And Noah, not only did you just write about the, um, what are they called? The Stay Ready Crew, but you also twice now have gone up to Maine to learn more about the Maine Celtics. You can get really in the weeds there. So in the second half of the program-ish, we will talk about the Boston Celtics bench and Noah, you're going to be our point person there. But first, we'll talk about the news, what's going on with the recent loss to the Clippers, the latest trade buzz, et cetera, et cetera. Before all of that, Noah, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about the bench because I always joke that I'm on, I feel like I'm on the bench beat. Like that's what I'm the most interested in covering, um, like all the developmental players and everything. So yeah, looking forward to that. And yeah, really excited to be here. Oh, I thought you meant like you're like you're in reserve. And I was like, yeah, me too, because we're well, that there. too. We're up there in the halo ready. <laughs> that too, that too. Alex, how are you? Doing fine. Just hanging out here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, got a chance to chat with Noah before the pod started recording. Uh, apparently, she has also been to Brooklyn somewhat recently. And we spent some time talking about how the Barclays Center is not up to snuff. Joe Sai, get it together. <laughs> yeah but like even if it was a nice place to visit i don't think it has like they don't have fans the new york liberty have terrific fans Brooklyn yeah so nets. it's not the building's problem not so it's, the, it's the nets franchise <laughs> All right, it was weird know. it was a, it was like a tie game with a minute to go versus the wizards but there was like nobody cheering it was so wild it felt like a blowout um it was like confusing but i mean in the defense of the Nets fans, this is a particularly sad season to be a Nets fan. But it's... Nick Claxton, to... I hope you have your real estate agent on speed dial, boss. <laughs> maybe the whole team. Uh, okay, but this is not the Nets Lab podcast. This is the Celtics Lab podcast. Let's <laughs> let's. I mean, we could bury the Nets all episode. I don't really mind. But I'm going to start by trying to bury the Celtics a little bit here. So the Celtics didn't just lose to the Clippers on Saturday, which they did, and they like really rolled over like dogs, but. That means that in the month of January, they lost to the Nuggets, the Bucks, and the Thunder. Last episode, I kind of teased, hey, they keep losing to good teams. What's good with that as a topic? And now with the Nuggets lost and the Clippers lost, kind of uh, standing tall in recent memory. What do you think, Noah? Like, any sense of concern? We have in our notes as a reminder that they beat Houston, Dallas, and Miami, but that feels like intellectually dishonest to include that information quite frankly. So no, a uh, level of concern with the Celtics vis-a-vis the best teams in the league. I mean, it would be nice if they had won a few of those. Um, and I almost feel like from a viewer standpoint, you feel better walking away from maybe you lost one really bad game against the Hawks, but then you had these resounding wins against title contenders. Like maybe psychologically that feels better because it shows you can stack up against these teams. Um, but in reality, I think it's, you know, they have the best record in the league. You have to lose some games. I'm not overly concerned about it. I think they played pretty well in the Nuggets game and for most of the Thunder game, the Bucks game was kind of a wash. Probably the one that was the most concerning was the Clippers game because it didn't really seem like, oh, they just couldn't hit a shot or like, oh, they just had no energy. It kind of felt like the Clippers figured some things out that were actually, you know, potentially concerning or at least shown light on some things that had already been concerning. So I think that maybe is the one that stands out the most. Um, but if they, you know, they have now six more games to this homestand, if they come out with some, a string of wins here, I don't think these losses really signify anything. Um, and if you think about it, I always think about it like in the sense of a seven game series, a seven game series, you you know, you win four, three, right? These are, yeah. these are the best teams in the league for a reason. And so nobody's really beating them on a regular basis. So it's not like the Celtics are going to sweep these teams either. Um, but yeah, it would have been nice if they had won at least like maybe one of those four. Um, but I'm not uh, really. What do you think? Um, I think so in terms of reasons to be concerned, I definitely don't want to act like the sky is falling because it's not. I know, as you mentioned, the Celtics have the best record in the league. They're doing fine. 
Um, I think there's two points that stand out to me. The first is this. I think that these losses, in particular the Clippers loss, should maybe cast some doubt not on the idea of the Celtics as a title contender, because they very much are, but as the as for the idea of the Celtics as a like overwhelming juggernaut favorite. They are not, and they never were. There are a lot of really good teams in this NBA, and the Celtics, I think, have done a really good job this year executing against uh, you know, a variety of different matchups. Overall, they've had a really strong season, and I don't want to knock that, but I haven't seen anything from them this year to really suggest that they should be held in this kind of different tier. I think at their best they can reach maybe a higher ceiling than anybody except for maybe the Denver Nuggets, who I think still have an incredibly high ceiling. But it's not like they are fully separate as like just a different tier of contender. I don't think they are. I think that we've seen that this year there's realistically maybe six or seven teams that could plausibly win the NBA title. And the Celtics are one of them. But I don't think of them as being like on a completely different plane that being said they are very good and I think that they've had a really good run and you know to Noah's point earlier I think it makes complete sense sometimes you lose and these teams are good like Denver's really good the Clippers are really good they've been as hot as anybody in recent history um I think if there's one area to point out as far as specific concerns go it's this, and I think I want to give a shout out to Jackson Frank, who pointed this out on Twitter. Um, terrific basketball analyst, writes mostly for Philly stuff, but has covered some league-wide as well. Um, there is still something that's happening in late game situations and in, in the case of the Clippers game pretty early on, where um, Jason Tatum still has times where against elite defenses, if they send two in a kind of late rotation as he's driving to the rim, he still has to make slightly better decisions on that. Um, I think in general, if there's a tried and true way to kind of disrupt Tatum's rhythm, it's not to send a quick double. It's not to go one-on-one -on -one and just try and lock him up. Sending those late help uh, closeouts as he's going to the rim, he has a tendency to kind of make questionable decisions on the move he's still not fully evolved as a passer and kind of bang bang decision maker yet and there are times when I think he understandably you know if you see two in the lane particularly if one of them is like Kawhi Leonard it's understandable that you'd want to pass out of that but um I think you know the counter to that is that Tatum is at his best when he's getting to the line and when he's forcing an agenda towards the rim and I'd like to see him I guess, develop his processing speed on that a little bit more. I also think there's something to be said for getting Derek White involved in a primary ball handler role a little bit more. Derek White has been slumping a little lately, but I think most of the slump has to do less with that and more with that Derek White is playing a lot of off-ball minutes right now. He is getting a lot of catch-and-shoot threes. He's kind of running around and cutting, and that's great and all, but... To me, the big step that Derek White has taken this year is that he's become a much more comfortable primary initiator. I'd love to see him on the ball a little bit more. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers join today and you get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Boston to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash Boston. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Thinking about kind of some of the wins and some of the good things that have been going uh, for Boston in this run, they haven't had any consecutive losses since November. But as you mentioned before, you know, some of the best teams have stymied Boston and have kind of made the made life difficult on them. What are you looking for as far as tonight's game against the Pelicans goes uh, when it comes to kind of rebounding from that uh, loss to the Clippers? Yeah, I think the main thing um, is that we saw a couple of really good things on the road trip. We saw in the Houston game 
uh, how Porzingis can be a really good number one option for large stretches of time, especially in the, you know late game situations, which he's been all year. Um, and then we also saw in the Dallas game what Jason and, and Jalen can look like at their best, um, particularly exploiting you know a lack of personnel to match up against them, but also just playing at their peak, which you know we don't see every night, and and we probably see still a little bit more. But I think tonight it would be great. I don't know if Porzingis is going to be available yet. I think he's still he's still questionable. Um, I would guess either him or Al suit up, and then tomorrow they'll kind of flip roles. But um, I'd love to see what they, if he's not around, if he's not available, I'd love to see um, if they can get Derek White going. I think Derek White has largely, like like you said, he's really benefited from Porzingis on the court and kind of their pick and roll game and all that. So like, can we get Derek White going when Porzingis is not out there? Um, I think that's that's a really important piece. And and just in general, um, can they come out and and play with really high energy and intensity for 48 minutes off the heels of a really bad loss like that. I think Missoula has talked a lot this year about how the regular season is less about like what your final record is going to be, but it's more about how are you emulating the playoffs and how are you emulating the highs and lows and emotions of the playoffs. And the Clippers loss was a really bad one. It was, you know, it was on their home court. It was after a road trip. It was after a home loss. And so, like, to me, tonight is less about, you know, schematically, what are they going to do versus the Pelicans? But it's more about how are you going to respond to the fact that you got pretty humiliated, you know, all things considered on Saturday night. Now you're playing against a team that's been pretty good this year, potentially down down a few players. And so what's the, how are you going to just m- mentally come out? That's kind of what I'm most curious about. Yeah, that makes sense to me, I think, just trying to keep that in mind and, you know, that it is a long season and that there are going to be these kind of volatile high and low moments. And, you know, it's like you said, like, I think it was not realistic for as great as the home win streak was, it was not realistic to expect that Boston was going to win every game at home this year, but it's more important to your point. Like, how do you respond from a bad loss? How do you kind of navigate some of the challenges of, um, you know, grappling with the regular season and coming up against the reality that like, as good as the Celtics have been this year, they still have some stuff to work out. Speaking of stuff to work out, first off, welcome back, Cam. Nice to see you. Um, Dude, you know, I, I can't believe the quality of my Wi-Fi. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I've been having some troubles here as well, but You're fingers crossed, knock on wood, hopefully we... Yeah, I'm, I'm at home. I I think they... I don't know. I, I got takes, but let's keep it moving. Um, where are we at? Right now, well, I, I had a beautiful segue ready to go, and then you came back, but that's okay. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so uh, we brought you on here, Noah, to talk a little bit about the end of the bench and to talk about uh, you know the Celtics kind of recapturing their mojo after a bad loss um, heading into this Pelicans game. I guess I'm curious, do we think the team as currently constructed is, is going to be able to recapture that mojo in the level that they would need to to win the title? Or does Boston need to make a move? How are we feeling about the trade deadline heading up? I don't think they need to make a move. Um, part of that is just my philosophy on midseason trades. I'm not a huge fan of disrupting a culture and chemistry that's working pretty well. Um, I also just think they have enough in house. If anything, I'd be curious, you know, just because of Przingis's health and how. He's a turned ankle away from, you know, missing a couple of weeks at a critical time. You know, maybe you think about, do you have trust in in Nemeus Keda in the playoffs? Like, I don't know if they feel that way yet. Um, so maybe that's what you look for. You look for just a big body on the market. And I don't think there's really one that stands out right now as like, this is the perfect fit for this team. And let's, we have all the resources to do it. But that'd be the only need I can think of. I think there's been a lot of discussion around, is there a, a, a you know, a backup wing that the team can get? Um, I think they have some options in house that are fine. I think O'Shea Brissett has had some really good minutes. Um, I think there's guys that can come in and play a couple of minutes here and there. I don't think we're going to see Jordan Walsh this year as much as a lot of people have been pushing for that. Um, but just considering what re- what assets they have at this point and how good they've played and how good their team chemistry and camaraderie has been, I would be pretty surprised if they did anything more than a very low end trade that doesn't actually have any impact on the remaining of the year. That's kind of where I'm at, at least with it. Mr. T, what do you think? Trade deadline, making big moves or little moves or any moves at all? I mean, it's really not like, no, I think that's well articulated. Usually you're not bartering from a position of strength if you have to make a big in-season trade. 
but it's really just a math problem. There just aren't that many assets out there that the Celtics could go and get or bring in. I think that Grant Williams' TP is $6.2 million, and it's very interesting, but the number of names that you can actually fit in that are probably smaller than you would think. And the possibility that the Celtics would take on that extra salary feels limited. Um, when we get into the bench, I think we'll identify things that we're kind of stressed about when it comes to the bench. But realistically, you don't need to run more than seven or eight deep. So unless there's a blue chipper out there, I don't really see the Celtics going for it. And then it comes back to a math problem because I think a lot of teams that want to be contenders would spend more, so to speak, to get said blue chipper. So yeah. it's we, we've been through trade deadlines where nothing happens. Like it's on the table, but absolutely nothing happens. It's tricky for me because I, I think there's definitely a point that like there, and I've been saying this for a while now, that it's really limited the kinds of players that Boston can acquire. I totally get that. And I also get the concerns about disrupting team chemistry, particularly on the bench, which I think has been pretty damn solid for Boston this year. Um, what's tricky to me is seeing other Eastern Conference teams loading up, you know, seeing the Indiana Pacers making this big trade for Pascal Siakam, knowing that um, Philly, for example, is sitting on a bunch of expiring contracts with a bunch of picks and uh, flexibility to kind of load up and make a big swing. You know, I guess I'm curious if you have thoughts, uh, we'll go to you first, Noah, and then to you, Cam. Um, how should the Celtics best approach trying to counter as some of these Eastern kind of almost contenders slash in the case of Philly, actual contenders um, start to make moves and kind of load up. You see like with Terry Rozier in Miami, like what's the best play to kind of counter that? I don't think they need to. I think it's like almost a, a false idea that they have to counter the punches of these other teams because they already have their big swing over the summer, right? Like they they kind of blew up this team over the summer, right? They they got rid of half of their rotation in favor of, you know, Przingis and Drew Holiday. And so they made their big swing. And you could say maybe that some of the other teams are looking to counter that. You know, they were late, especially, you know, Drew Holiday coming right before training camp. So you could say that maybe that's what's happening there. But if, if you know, if, if the Pacers acquiring Pascal Siakam is what's going to prevent uh, the Celtics from winning the championship, then then there were bigger issues at play, right? Like nothing that they do right now is going to move the needle. So I would be surprised. I think if anything, they're looking internally and they're thinking, you know, we have some health concerns in the front court. Like even Luke Cornett's had some issues with this, you know, the hamstring injury that keeps really popping up. So maybe they're thinking like we need another sizable big just from like a, purely from like a our roster construction standpoint. I don't think they're looking at another Eastern Conference team right now and saying, you know, they did this, so we need to do this in in turn. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but that's my, at least that's my, that's my perspective on it. Cam, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, if you're not, <laughs> if Pascal Siakam is standing between you and a trip to the finals, like you <laughs> have bigger problems. No, that's exactly right. So I think, <clears throat> you know, people are agitating for like, why aren't they going to make a trade? Why aren't they making a trade? Like, they did. They did it over the summer. They made two huge trades. So other teams might be positioning themselves to make the trades now or even like do the pre-agency thing where they set up themselves for next year. The Boston Celtics not only set themselves up for this year, probably for the year after that, and perhaps the year after that too, the, the CBA, the new CBA is no joke. And Boston is painted into a corner, but it's a really good corner to be painted into. So I don't think the expectation for many moves uh, I don't think people should hold on to those expectations mm -hmm. unless something bad was happening. But uh, apropos of Kawhi Leonard stealing their lunch money Saturday night, things are looking pretty good. Yeah. A couple of things to look forward to uh, heading into February and this next stretch. Obviously, first off, congratulations, Jason Tatum being an all-star starter. Um and on Thursday, we will learn more about the Celtics All-Star chances as the All-Star reserves are going to be announced when the Celtics welcome the Los Angeles Lakers to the TD Garden. Noah, I'm curious, what are some things you're looking forward to in the month of February? Yeah, so super excited for the Lakers game because I'm covering that one in person. So just looking forward to it from a 
standpoint that, that from just from that perspective. But I think in general, we talked about how they've struggled a little bit against some of the top tier teams. And we all know, we've all heard they've had one of the toughest schedules to date, and it's going to, you know, it's going to get a lot easier moving forward. So the question is, can they keep up the intensity and the execution and everything when they're looking ahead and their next six games are against sub 500 teams? Because we know past Celtics teams have not been able to do that. And so to me, it's like this, this, there's this question around like, can you wake up for these games? And and I think that does show something about the character and kind of not character, but uh, about the team's kind of mental going into the playoffs. If you if you can or you can't. And I think last year there were a lot of bad losses during the season that maybe foreshadowed a lot of letdowns that came in the playoffs, right? Like the 3-0 hole versus Miami, things like that. So um, I'm really curious to see how they respond to a much lighter schedule because they've responded well so far, right? You know, regardless of the four losses, they they have a really good record. So if anything, it should only get better, but that's not, you know, things aren't always linear. We know I I look at the box scores on NBA in the NBA app every day thinking like, okay, these are my predictions. And I'm like wrong about all of them every single day because <laughs> that's not how basketball works. So I think whether or not a lighter schedule yields better outcomes or at least like maintain outcomes, I'm curious about. And then yeah, super bummed about Marcus Martin not playing. Um, actually, I got my whole family tickets to that game. Um, it was supposed to be a big, a big moment, big thing. I think, hopefully, I think he's still going to be there. Gary Washburn reported that, so um, hopefully they still do the video or at least they like acknowledge him in some sense because he's like he's like in the building. But that would have been really, really special. So um, a little bit of a bummer there. Yeah, I would say I'm definitely looking forward to Marcus's return, even if he is going to be wearing street clothes. You know, that guy just meant so much to me personally as a fan and to, well, everything that this team was basically prior to this season. A couple of other things I'm looking forward to um, for starters. I really want to see how this team matches up with Philly on February 27th after I, I think the trade deadline is before then. No, could be wrong. Um, regardless, that's going to be, I think, a pretty important matchup in a lot of ways. Philly has been playing really well this year. Joel Embiid looks like he is going to go back to back for MVP. And in general, they look like a much better team under Nick Nurse. And I've been kind of saying this basically all season. So I'll be really interested to see, hopefully, fingers crossed that they are healthy first off, and that um, we get like a true contest between these two teams. Cause I have a sneaking suspicion that we might be encountering them again in a postseason run. Um, I'm of course also looking forward to the all-star game uh, just at the very least to see what other Celtics are going to make it feel pretty good about Jalen Brown's chances. Chris Tapps, Porzingis and Derek White, a little dicey. There's, I think, a chance that Kristaps Porzingis sneaks in, potentially, if Julius Randle is sidelined for that game. Sounds like Tyrese Halliburton is not going to be sidelined for that game, as he's coming back to play the Celtics in only a couple of days, it sounds like. Um, and then, aside from that, I am looking forward to this team getting healthy. Kristaps Porzingis is out tonight. Al Horford is available. Luke Cornette is also out so I would love it for this front court and for the rest of this team to be fully healthy heading into March. Cam, what are you looking forward to in February? I'm looking forward to the Super Bowl, which means it's time to pause the action and talk about our friends over at FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, and placing some super bets. Indeed, I really like the prop bets. I'm really interested to see uh, where the timing for the national anthem comes in. And I got to imagine that there's going to be a lot of prop bets around Taylor Swift and whether or not she makes it to the game from Tokyo, which will be exciting. I also obviously love the commercials and the food. But I love that I can bet over on FanDuel on all sorts of stuff related to the game itself. And FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers can join today, and they'll get $200 in bonus bets if they bet $5 or more. If a bet of $5 or more wins, just visit FanDuel.com slash Boston to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash Boston. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. You must be 21 or older in Massachusetts. Hope is here. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit is required. 
Bonuses are issued as a non-withdrawable bonus bet that expires seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling helpline ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. Play it smart from the start. GameSenseMA.com or call 1-800-GAM-1234. Okay, back to the program. And Alex, I can quarterback this one. I think I fixed the Wi-Fi. All right. So, I believe in you. For what it's worth for betting purposes, I am looking at whether Usher is going to debut Confessions Part 3. I need to find action on that immediately. <laughs> is, that a th- is that a thing? I don't know if it's a thing, but I need to find action. <laughs> I wonder if we could get Usher on the podcast. For now. Um, so Noah, we are going to talk about the bench and you really are well equipped to do this because you have put in the hours. Um, did you say you're going to the Lakers game? Yes. Cool. I'll see you there. Yeah, I got the Wi-Fi cut out, but my Clippers take was basically going to be that I think Kawhi Leonard is shadow the best and the best player in the league and I spent all of the Clippers game bothering Noah talking about that. (laughs) Okay, let's talk about the big picture for the bench. And then later we're going to talk about uh, different accolades for the Stay Ready crew. We'll keep it short. We'll keep it sweet. Um, But first, let's take a macro view. So whether or not uh, Boston's bench is a problem is a little relative. So sort of, you don't have to have an exact number. But Noah, where do you place Boston's bench? vis-a-vis the rest of the league um, in terms of depth, in terms of flexibility, just like how do you rank it in terms of the rest of the league? It's probably middle of the pack. Um, and this is coming from a, a big bench fan, but I think objectively some other teams have just bigger, you know, just more depth and and just more talent probably. Um, but the reality is I think you have – Al Horford coming off the bench, who is a starter level player who brings is just invaluable on the court, not a liability really by any means. And then you have Peyton Pritchard, who has had not the most consistent offensive year, but I think has had a really good year and a really good impact whenever he's been on the court, hence why he's been on the top leaderboard of the plus minus stat sheet. And also just has just been like just from the eye test, like every time he checks in, he's just a burst of energy for this team. He's plays really good defense, smart on offense, one of the best assist to turnover ratios in the league. So I think you have a couple of people who have been really reliable. And then you have a, a couple of others that are have been really good bodies that can come in and play hard. Um, and there's a reason why they're on minimum contracts. They're not the most polished scorers. They're not, you know, I, we watch them in warm-ups, they're not the best shooters, they're not like you know, there's, I think other teams maybe have more depth in that sense, but I think you have between Pritchard and Horford and Hauser, who's had a pretty good year, all things considered, you know, he's had a little bit of ups and downs, but he's been, he's been pretty solid. Um, and then Brissett, I think in the opportunities that he has had has, has been pretty, pretty good too. He's, you know, come in in moments and for five minute bursts brings, you know, can almost change the game. I think he's, there's been a couple of games that guys have attributed to him being a turning point. So you know, I, I have confidence in the in the bench. I think if you look at some other teams, there's probably like Indiana or some other group. You know, they have a, you have scores off the bench. I don't think this is a team that has you know 40 points a night off the bench. Um, but that's not really what they need. They need guys that can just kind of like maintain the energy and come in and play hard and play smart and play within the system and within themselves. And I think you have that with this group. And maybe more than anything, Tatum just spoke about this too. I think it was an, in a Mark Spears interview, but he said this is a really the most selfless team that he's been on. It's, you know, it's hard to find guys that are really good, but okay with playing zero minutes a night. Like Lamar Stevens is a guy who last year was a a starter on a playoff team for large portions of the season. And this year he's DNP almost every night, right? So the fact that he's coming in and he's bringing in a good energy and he's playing hard and he's always in good spirits. And I've spoken to him about this. He said, this is the most fun I've had. I'm having a great time. Everybody loves being in the state ready group. Like that's really rare and that's really important. So that's, there's like a mental aspect to this as well. But I think from a production standpoint, like you're not going to get as much scoring as other teams in the league. I actually don't know where they stand as far as bench points. I'd be curious to look that up. Um, but I think just as far as like fit, you have a really good group here. Alex, what about you? You're on mute. We're so good at this. <laughs> We're so good at this. Um, I am curious to see uh, the bench stats as it, stands right now for what it's worth boston's bench does have the best net rating in the league at 4.2 which is kind of crazy um 
I do think, you know, it's, it's interesting to see kind of people making different sacrifices and, uh, you know, kind of roles changing, as you mentioned, Noah. I mean, for me, the bench really does start with Al Horford. And I think what's tricky about this is that come playoff time, realistically, a lot of these guys who are playing heavy minutes right now are probably going to be used in situational roles at best. I think of like an O'Shea Brissett or uh, Sfi Mikhailia, guys who will, you know, moonlight off the bench coming in here and there, or Anemius Keita, you know. These are guys who I think have made, in times, meaningful contributions to Boston's uh, effort overall this year and have generally been pretty solid for them. I would be very surprised if those guys are playing in the playoffs outside of like very specific situational roles. So it definitely does come down to this chemistry and this notion of you have to be okay with the reality that like guys are not always going to play. Guys are going to have to sacrifice, particularly off of this bench. Guys are going to have to be in places where they can be comfortable knowing that like, hey, Peyton Pritchard, you know, you're going up against, uh, uh, I don't know, name a great Eastern Conference six man. Uh, tonight's not your night. Like, we're going to just be running Drew Holiday and Derek White at point for the whole game, basically, or something like that. You know, it's it's tricky because I think for a lot of these guys, the incentive of like, obviously, like, there's the incentive of winning and there's the incentive of like playing into the broader team concept. But I think, you know, for bench guys in particular, there is always an incentive to get more playing time to, you know, kind of build up your value and to kind of show what you're worth, if not for this team, then for teams that will be looking at you in the future. And it's going to be, I think, interesting to see how that manifests in the playoffs where guys are going to be the guys who do come in off the bench are going to likely be looking to like really assert themselves and have like signature playoff moments that will raise their value around the league and cause ears to pick up and that feels like it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand you definitely need bench performances like i think of like you know the Denver Nuggets last year, who really went seven deep, but got some terrific performances from guys like Jeff Green or, you know, when they were kind Reggie of bringing, Jackson. Yeah, Reggie Jackson off the bench, like these random bench performances that ultimately were a fairly important part of their title run. And you want guys who are hungry and who are looking to have that moment. But at the same time, you also have to be thoughtful about the team concept. Like, you don't necessarily want Peyton Pritchard taking 15 shots in a critical playoff game. I think it, it, it's a really tricky balancing act. And so to the point of, like, whether the up bench needs to be upgraded or, upgraded or not, I think it, it's, as you mentioned before, it's really tricky to figure out how to maintain that good chemistry and feed all of the mouths that need to get fed. Yeah, while you guys were talking, I, I looked it up. Um... But Celtics bench is 27th. However, they are fourth in three point percentage, second in turnovers, as in second fewest turnovers. And I forget who had it, second in plus minus. So the bench isn't providing scoring pop necessarily, but it doesn't need to. I mean, again, the construction is really top heavy. There's six starter level guys. So at no point does Joe ever roll with fewer than two starters on the floor. Um, I've said this to both of you and to the internet and whoever will listen. I really like the group of Tatum, Holiday, and then Hauser, Pritchard, and Cornette. And Hauser, Pritchard, and Cornette don't need to light it up. They just need to not turn the ball over and hit threes and facilitate Jason Tatum. So the extent to which like the depth of the bench matters is limited because the top six are super deep anyways. And so they're kind of uh, like accent puzzle pieces rather than critical puzzle pieces. So, I mean, I do think that going back to the Clippers, the Clippers have an interestingly deep bench. The Pacers are number one in bench scoring. Like there are teams that are getting it done with the bench, but that's not really how the game is played in the spring. So perhaps it doesn't matter. Alex, to your point, if they wanted to consolidate and then turn, you know, guys 9, 10, 11, and 12 into perhaps a more steady, a reliable, productive player, go for it. But like that's 
asking to rock the boat. That like one of the things, no, to your point, O'Shea Brissett comes in, does a pretty good impression of market smart and then doesn't play for three games. And that's a re really unique thing to find is that they have right now guys who can do things like that um, without needing consistent burn, without needing consistent pats on the back, without needing to worry about their next contract. That it's pretty admirable. Okay, so those are, that's our summative view of the bench. Let's gamify it. I'm gonna give you guys some prompts and you have between 10 and 20 seconds to explain yourself. You don't need to, you can just give your answer and move on, but no more than 20 seconds, how's that? So, Noah, if you were writing the rotation for the Boston Celtics, so not going off of what you've observed or what the data says, but you were coaching the Boston Celtics, how would you answer these questions? Alex, you too. Who would be your sixth man? Al. And right now. Al would be Al Horford. Alex? Mute. Mute, yeah. mute face yeah, over it's, here. It's also Al Horford. I'll be a contrarian and say I'm still Drew Holiday, six man curious, but that's probably two seasons from now. <laughs> oh, Chelsea, we didn't talk about his extension or lack thereof, but he did say he wants to sign an extension mid season and he hasn't yet. Okay, anyways, Noah. That's not till so, April. You're burying the lead. He can't sign it until April. <laughs> oh, he can't? Yeah, no, he's legally not allowed by the structure of his current contract to sign until April. <laughs> I'm going to specifically throw Bobby Kravitsky under the bus for misleading <laughs> him. <laughs> Noah, say Horford is, you can't pick the top six. They're in and out. I mean, that's how this team operates anyways. Outside of the top six, who is your first off the bench? Pritchard. And I think actually Pritchard sometimes, I do, I, I'm, I, I, I know Joe is the coach for a reason and I'm not, but <laughs> I, do think, I do think sometimes Pritchard is, uh, comes in too late like his energy would benefit the team would benefit from his energy a little bit earlier I think about this all the time sometimes where it's like you start to see the starters falter like they hit they hit that six minute mark where I'm like let's get Peyton Pritchard in because he's going to come in and he's just going to make good decisions and he's going to bother the guy that he's guarding and so I think he'd be next up and maybe even there's a case to be made for him like to come in with you know come in first up or, or with Al and he doesn't always that's my that's my that's my qualm all right Alex you're right going to swing it the other way uh i'm going to focus as much as possible on playoff mode what this bench looks like in playoff mode and for me the guy who should be coming in right after al horford and maybe with al horford has got to be sam hauser shooting 40 percent from three this year has improved as a defender he's big he's mobile he's improving as a cutter as well and i just think that he really accentuates a lot of what this team does well on the floor particularly when he's paired with starters as a kind of release valve shooter i'm going with sam yeah no the the project thing i i'm inclined to agree with you but i feel like they ro rotate around letting jalen eat a little bit by himself and Richard might cut into that. I think he plays better off of Tatum than he does off of Brown, which is, I think, a Jalen Brown problem, not a Peyton Pritchard problem. Um, apropos of that, like, I, I'm eating a lot of crow here. I, I was down on Pritchard early in the season, and I can't really find reason to stay down on him. Um, let's see if he gets hunted on defense in the playoffs. But I think by a hair, it's Pritchard because he's got that crazy factor. But what Hauser's doing is so steady and so helpful. I trust right. Pritchard in playoffs more than Hauser. I like both of them a lot. I think they're both very solid players. But I think as far as like, I looked at Hauser's away numbers versus home numbers, three-point shooting, and it's such a big disparity. And that's like such a playoff red flag to me, like that distinction. Um, I just think Pritchard doesn't, you, you know, you don't see him, like he he want, he takes big shots. Like he's just, he has like, you saw, I mean, I don't know if you guys followed him in college, but he, he hit so many big shots in college. Like I think he just has that in him. Not that Hauser doesn't, but... Um, I just have to throw that in there. He has the same like gravel in his gut that you can't really quantify. Yeah. Um, but that's interesting. I mean, the team, uh, low key, I'm a little worried about the Celtics being kind of meh on the road, but. but Everybody is, though. There's no team that's good on the road this year. Yeah, that's they have the best home, uh, most, best road record in the league, I think, tied with the Timberwolves. Like, really? But... Aren't they like 14 and 11 on the road? Yeah. I think they're 15 and 11. Okay. That's a little bit. That's marginally better. All righty. Um, Let's do this one. Uh, the three guys that make the playoff rotation. So assuming it's uh, Holiday, White, T 
Tatum Brown and Porzingis are the starters. Who are the three guys who get playoff for him? Uh, Noah, I'll go to you again. Um, off the bench, so Al, Pritchard, and Hauser would be my three. Alex? Um, I think when in the go-to situation, it's definitely Al, Pritchard, Hauser. I, I completely agree. I will say, I think in a matchup-dependent situation, there are instances where I could see Missoula going to O'Shea Brissett and Luke Cornett occasionally. Yeah, I think I think I'm going to go. Sorry uh, to Sam, but I think I'm probably going to go Pritchard, Cornett, Horford. I just like you can't not have Horford. But then, look, they're going to run through some pretty big guys in the postseason, and if only to use up his six fouls. Like Cornett is a big body, and Porzingis is. Swiss cheese protecting the rim. He stinks protecting the rim against another big. Like Jokic ate his lunch. And I'm not saying uh, Cornette does much better, but just to like take the pressure off of Porzingis, I do wonder. Um, it, so, in so fairness it to Kristaps, in fairness to Kristaps, Jokic eats everybody's lunch. He is the best basketball player in the world. <laughs> yeah, but there's a there is something fundamentally different about eating someone's lunch who's like is physically your size like when Jokic matches up against someone who's six inches taller than him it actually doesn't surprise me when he can shoot over top or pass Porzingis like has the length and the size that he should be able to bother him and that was not the case it was the same thing that happened with the heat they had Jimmy Butler guard Porzingis and Porzingis would just like flop it over Jimmy because Jimmy wasn't big enough I guess that's true. I just feel like in this specific instance, Jokic also like worked the guy who I think many would consider the best big man defender in the league in Bam Adebayo in the finals last year. I think he's just matchup proof. He just destroys everybody in front of him. It's my internet. Great. Uh, he seems frozen. I'm back. Yeah. Oh my god, Xfinity or Verizon like sponsor this podcast and <laughs> beam us some better Wi-Fi. It's ridiculous. Okay, uh, let's keep it moving. Nice and quick. No, I'll go to you because who knows we still have Alex. By the end of the regular season, what bench player has had the most total minutes? Not average minutes, total minutes. Richard, because he hasn't missed any games, and he's seen he's he's seeming really durable. Al's like disqualified just because he's back to backs. Um, and then I think, yeah, I think Pritchard will probably lead that. Alex? Alex, give us a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, no change here. Yeah, I, I can't find an alternative. Um, I didn't come up with stuff, so that's okay. Okay, uh, this one's interesting. Who on the Celtics bench, let's say between two and five years from now, are we going to say had the most untapped potential? So maybe hmm. they, they play out, they play big in the postseason. They get a contract somewhere else, and uh, who knows? They're they're better than we ever expected. Noah, you're the guest. You get to go first. Who on the Celtics bench is sitting on a wealth of potential? In theory, I would say Lamar Stevens in the sense that we know that he can do more than what we're seeing right now. He hasn't looked great in limited minutes. I mean, really limited minutes, but I feel like he just looks like he struggles to, to put the ball in the basket, frankly. Um, so maybe him, I wouldn't be shocked if he leaves Boston and joins another team and he's back in being a rotation player, just cause we've seen it before. Um, and then I think there's guys like Delano Banton, who I do think down the road will be an NBA player. Um, he might just not be there yet from a developmental standpoint. So I don't know if that counts as much just because he's young and he needs more run and things like that. But I, I do think I, it's not going to shock me if in three three years he's you know he's a backup point guard in this league. Like, I think he has that in him. All right, Alex, what about you? I continue to believe that if he can just find his shooting form, O'Shea Brissett could be a really really useful player. Like I, that guy hustles so hard on defense. He's super switchable. He can get rebounds and traffic. He's got a little bit of drive game as well, just particularly in that he has some real athleticism. He can throw down a dunk or two. The only reason that O'Shea Brissett doesn't play as much as I think he could play is because the shot has just not been consistent at any point in his NBA career. 
But man, if we could get that guy hooked up with the right shooting coach and just really hone in on like being a corner three specialist, I think he could be like a very rock solid rotation player for somebody. Yeah, I mean, you figure you take away that like two series stretch where Grant Williams was one of the best defenders in the league. I don't know why O'Shea can't be as good as Grant Williams. Again, apropos that like one stretch. Um, I like the Banton thing. He's he, just his his size and his speed are so unique. I'd be very interested to see what it would look like to like let him get out and sprint, but that's not going to happen with the Celtics, I don't think. Okay, let's do one more, and then Noah, I want to ask you about some of the reporting you've done in Maine and elsewhere. So the trade deadline is next week. Noah, who on the Celtics bench is most likely to not be on this team in 10 days? Hmm. 12 days, whatever it is. This is total speculation, so I almost don't want to say it, but maybe Lamar Stevens from for the very same reason that I just gave. I think some of these other guys are not really trade assets in, in how unproven they are. Like maybe a SV, I would say, but I don't think I think Lamar might be more of a trade chip than than a SV. So maybe him, but again, I would bet on I would bet on there not being a trade. So that would be my first choice. But I think someone like him might have some value for other teams in the league. Else. Um, realistically, I think any one of the Delano Banton, Sfi Mikhailiak, um, Lamar Stevens trio could be on a different team just as salary ballast. Um, I don't particularly expect that teams that are trading for end of bench guys for the Boston Celtics are doing so with the intention of like taking a serious flyer on those players. They would probably be doing so more with like. I assume picks would be attached. So I think it really could be any one of those guys. I'm at least keeping my eye on Luke Cornett. I don't think he will be traded. I think he has endeared himself a little too much to the locker room and has definitely like made an impact in the moments that he's been on the floor for the most part. But there's definitely a world in which the right offer comes along and Brad Stevens sees a chance to get really aggressive and try and make something happen. And Luke Cornett for salary or um, role reasons has to be a part of that deal. I don't think it's very likely, but it's, it's at least a possibility. There's a world where this team is good enough and historically financially shrewd enough that even though they're like, we're going to spend, we're going to spend, we're going to spend. O'Shea Brissett has a $2.5 uh, million dollar player option for next season. It wouldn't be crazy if they moved him for a couple second round picks or a second round pick and then just ask Svi or a buyout guy to fill those minutes because that's a way for them to protect against the hurt from next season. Although I guess team control cheap contract doesn't hurt either. So I'll take Brissett just to be a little spicy, but I'm team probably nothing happens which of course means between now and when this gets edited someone's gonna get traded all right noah you have been talking to the stay ready crew i want to ask you about that and then you spent some time in maine i want to ask you about that so what it like let's return to the kind of the question at the top of the lab what's the character of the deep bench like what did you, what have you learned about these guys and like how they see their role how the team sees their role how the stars see their role what do you think of where did the stay ready? Where did that term come from? I don't know where it came from. The first person that said it was Jason Tatum. In my, I think I'm almost certain about that, but that he used that as an answer um, to a question in a presser. But there, the main things I would say from having, I've spoken to a few of them one on one at just like different community events and things. But they're all really happy to be a part of this team, and their number one objective is what do I what can I do to help this team win a championship? Because if that happens, everybody eats. Like that has been explicitly said to me a couple of times by different players. Kata said that last week. He said that, like I said, asked him if he had any personal goals. And he was like, my only personal goal is for this team to win a championship. And like, whether that means that I have to be like a good energy or whatever that means, like that's, that doesn't matter. So, and, and it's easy to say, but you see it, you see it on the court by just watching body language. You see it, in a blowout game like we had on Saturday that they're out there playing really, really hard with the game totally out of reach. 
And the starters like Derek White and other guys are actually like super engaged and standing up and cheering. And like, there's that connectivity between the end of roster guys and the stars, which is, you would think would be intuitive, but it's not always there. And a lot of times you have guys that are vying for their next big deals or think, you know, wanting a trade. Like even last year, we had guys like Grant Williams and Peyton Pritchard who weren't happy with their role and opportunity. And it just like, it impacts the the feel of the group when you have people that are unhappy that are hoping to be, you know, to find another home and things like that. So I think with this group, you have a, a mix of guys that are, that are happy to be here that are not like, they don't, I don't think that any of them feel like super on, un- maybe they would hear this and say that's totally off base, but I don't think any of them feel super underutilized. Like I should be a star and like, why am I in this role? Whereas like sometimes you have those guys that just feel like I'm way better than uh, five minutes a night or zero minutes a night. I don't think you have that kind of ego with these guys. Um, I think they're really happy to be a part of the best team in the league right now and a part of this winning culture and a part of um, a coaching staff that has really made them feel important too. That's been another big theme that Missoula talked about last year that I think when he got thrust into, the, into this role so last minute, he didn't have the time to connect with guys, you know, 10 through 15 and and make sure that they were kind of locked in and feeling nourished and all that. And I think this year, because he had the off season and he has the coaching staff that he's assembled, he's actually managed to make sure that all of those relationships are really strong and that's gone a long way as well. Yeah, excellent. I mean, that, that much was clear in the story that you had for Celtics blog. Um, and it was well-timed that on Saturday they got, what were they, they scored 36 points in the fourth quarter. So they, they did. They stayed, re- <laughs> they stayed ready. Stayed ready. Um, all right, so you also, not, not only have you looked at the deep bench in Boston, but you even have trekked up to Maine um, now twice. So first of all, everyone go read Noah's stories out of Maine, but um, what were some of the highlights? And then you specifically talked to Jordan. What was your experience with Jordan Walsh like? So first I will say everybody should go up to Maine. It's Cam, you were there, you were there as a fan. It's a great vibe. It just like really, if you like basketball, like it's a really good environment to just watch basketball and really just like really cool atmosphere. Um, but being up there, I've been up there a couple of times now. Uh, it's a weird, it's a weird dynamic in the sense that you have a bunch of guys that are trying to get into the league. So like inherently that's not going to foster like the best camaraderie or team culture like you would think I think this group is actually really special and that they have a veteran on the team Tony Snell who has been instrumental to keeping that group engaged and every time a guy checks out of the game Tony's the first guy to come up to talk to him and uh kind of uplift him and everything you know he's 10 year NBA vet that's a very unique situation not every G League team has that Uh, and then you also have guys like JD Davison that's now like almost like a G League star like he's putting up star numbers in the G League and I'm sure he is ready to go to the NBA and he's ready to be get his number called. But right now he's excelling on the, the floor that he has. Um, and then you have Jordan Walsh, who I think is a, who everybody cares about from this G League team. Like I notice even if I like tweet a picture of Jordan Walsh from the G League games versus anybody else that's playing really well, like nobody cares about the other people. Everybody cares about Jordan Walsh. Um, he's emulating the role that he's going to play in the NBA. Obviously way more touches and a bigger role, but he's playing like spot up three and D guy. He's not, they're not running the offense through him. They're not, you know, maybe he's handling the ball a little bit more than he would. Uh, but generally speaking, they're keeping him in a role that he's going to have once he is a Boston Celtic. Um, and once he's actually in that rotation, which I think people are hoping will be in the next you know year or so. And so that's, those are kind of been the main storylines. They they're like about a 500 team. I know nobody really cares about G league record, um, but from their standpoint, like that's, that's still important. You know, I think that they want to be able to individually succeed under a winning culture. Um, and so I've talked to the coach about this Blaine Miller a couple of times. He really cares about them winning games and he cares about everybody doing their part to help them win, not just doing their part to get their stats. And so that's kind of been a really intentional part of all of this. Um, and then I'll just mention Drew Peterson, two-way player signed by the, by the Celtics in December. He made his first NBA basket in LA when they played the Clippers, I believe. And he hasn't been down in Boston at all since then. He's been playing in Maine. He came from Miami's preseason training camp. He was playing for Sioux Falls. So I think he's really good. And I think he's going to be an NBA player and people are sleeping on him. I'm going to plug him in now, January 29th. I think he's going to be a rotation player for the Celtics. Um, He has like the Sam Hauser shooting. He might even have a quick release. 
Um, and he has, he's just a very well-balanced all around player. And he's kind of like a veteran in the sense that he's 23, he's undrafted, but he played five years in college. So he, he's a smart kind of older player. Um, so that's another guy that I've just been watching when I go up there. Um, I think he's going to be a contributor. So those are the three, I think, you know, Drew, um, sorry, JD, Jordan, and, and Drew are the three that people are kind of more, most interested in because they're, you know, players on the Celtic. I think the other guys probably, if they get picked up, they might not even be in Boston, um, but they've all shown flashes of like, I can see how this would translate to a, an NBA game, um, albeit in a much more scattered, kind of a less professional environment. I am so happy that you mentioned Tony Snell, who yeah. I am just thrilled that he is even on the main team. Uh, and I am a big Tony Snell guy. I have always been a big Tony Snell guy. He's just one of my favorite players. Uh, I don't know why or how this happened, but it did. Um, and so I'm I'm thrilled to hear that he's contributing. I'm thrilled to hear that he's taken on a vet leadership role. And listen, if the Celtics do end up making moves around the trade deadline and they need an extra body to bring in with some NBA experience, wouldn't hurt to give Tony a ring, see if he's doing anything. And maybe he'll get a ring. Yeah, it's uh, I'll put a plug in for going to a main Celtics game. Um, not to be crass, but I'm pretty sure the baseline seats were like $68. And you could go and see not just your favorite NBA player, Tony Snell, but an up and coming potential NBA player, uh, Drew Peterson. Like the access you get to really, really high quality hoops is unbelievable. Um, no, I think you found this too. Just the people are really nice. People work for the team, they work for the stadium. That's just. They're so I mean, nice. Yeah. I think the state of Maine just has fine people, but it's unbelievable how nice the people were. No, did you get to see the L.L. Bean jerseys in action? I don't think so. Um, okay. But I so wouldn't notice something like that. That's like the last thing I would notice. But in theory... I don't think you'd notice them. They look it, ridiculous. No, I've seen them on... I've seen them like in the in the clips, but like just... Yeah, maybe they weren't wearing them because I, maybe I would have walked away no, noting that. Dude, I feel like you'd have to notice. They're like... They're so... I'm really not observing. Like my, no, it, it, I... Trust me, Cam, if you knew me better, you, you would know. I would not notice. That's us. It feels impossible to me, but okay. I think you were. <laughs> Are you going back at all this season? Yeah, I'm gonna go back. I think I'm trying to go days when the Celtics aren't playing. So I think January, February 10th is my next slotted, slotted visit. So be on the lookout for more Drew P Peterson propaganda that nobody picks up on. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you are a fan of the main Celtics, you should check out Noah Dalzell's work over at Celtics Blog. If you're a fan of the regular Celtics, you should check out Noah's work as well. If you are a fan of FanDuel, I'll remind you that this episode of the Celtics Up podcast was brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. If you're a fan of funky tunes, check out Divine Sweater, Alex Butler's bass on that wonderful band. And if you're a fan of the Celtics Up podcast and you haven't liked or subscribed, please do that. It helps us so, so much. Uh, the algorithms run our lives. So, Noah, thank you. I'll see you on Thursday. Everyone else, thank you very much. And we'll catch you soon. Adios. Adios.